Hello and welcome to Adobe APAC Live. My name is Flynn. I'm really excited to be the host this afternoon and I'm here with Jeremy Lord, illustrator extraordinaire. What is up? Hey, how are you going, man? All good? I'm really good. Really tough to be here again, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you were the very first Adobe APAC Live um, artist, guest. Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah, it was. I had a really good time and obviously you guys liked it because you yeah. asked me back. So, yeah, we yeah. did. Yeah, which is really, really cool. Um, and so, hey to everyone in the chat. Um, Alexander, Boone, um, Idios World, what's up? Real hey, name. Man. How's it going? I, I think Good Jeremy you. might know yeah. who that is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Jump into the chat. Uh, we love to interact with you guys. Um, we'd love to have a chat with you. You can ask questions for the next hour. Um, we're going to be talking all things colour illustration and so on and so forth. Um, so if uh, you can log into the chat room by using your Creative Cloud ID. So that's your Adobe ID that you would use to log into any of your apps or anything like that. Um, if you don't have one, you can sign up to one really, really quick. Um, so it only takes a couple of minutes and then you can jump straight in, ask us questions, say hello. Where are you guys all from? Um, we've got a lot of new faces in there. It's quite a big chat room today. So we'd love to find out where you guys are from. A lot of people from Australia. I think we have some new people from India as well. Um, we'd love to hear from you. So let us know in the chat. Meanwhile, maybe we should have a chat yeah. about what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, so um, uh, today we're going to be talking mostly about colour. So last time I was here, we talked a lot about the process and how I do the artwork where I get my inspiration from. Mm -hmm. um, this time around, I thought I'd chat a little bit more about colour because it's a really important part of my work. Yeah. Uh, and it's something that I spend a lot of time on, probably maybe a bit too much time on. Right. Um, so, yeah, so I'll be going through kind of the process of how I choose my colours, how to make them work together, um, sprinkle in a few sort of Photoshop tips in there as well as to, you know, how best to manage them. But, um, mm. yeah. That's basically it. Pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it should be good. And this is one of your pieces of work behind us, actually, yeah. on the magic screen, which yeah, is super so it's cool. Yeah, it's an old kind of Akira-influenced kind of 80s cyberpunk. Just, yeah, just words. Bunch of words. Bunch of, a bunch of fancy-sounding yeah, words. That's that's me. Um, maybe let's see a piece of your work. I don't know if you want to bring up your website, if you want to bring yeah. up one of these examples. It's totally up to you. Yeah, so um, so my website, um, jeremylord.com. So as you guys can see, probably there's um, there's a bunch of stuff on here. Um, it ranges from, you know, 80s, a very sort of Japanese influence. I've got a very sort of manga um, influenced childhood. Yeah. And that's starting to kind of, kind of come back up. Um, love the, the neon colors, the aesthetics of kind of the 80s as well, and how yeah. that kind of plays into cyberpunk. And 2019 is the year that uh, Akira happens, that uh, Blade Runner happens, and right. that Running Man happens. So, We're living it. Where's my flying car? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, What's going on? No flying cars, but also no apocalypse. So well, I think we're okay. That's true. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of like a really broad sort of overview of all the work that I do, as you guys can see. A um, lot of very kind of bright neon colors. Um, you guys will see that again today. Mm. Um, but um, yeah. Look at that color work. Hey, look, at, look at the chat room as well. It's blowing up. Hey, everyone. We've got some New Zealanders in there. G'day, our friends. Hong Kong, Christy S. We see you a couple of times. I didn't know you were from Hong Kong. That's super cool. JC, also Hong Kong. Hong Kong in the house. Represent. Mullen Bimby, what's up, Stuart? That is so wow. cool. That's so great. Um, pressure, pressure. Yeah, absolutely. Like this is great. Yeah. Um, so if you do have any questions, um, please let us know. Um, Jeremy's going to get under the hood from some of his work. Yep. Um, it's super, super cool. But before we do get into that, where <coughs> does, I mean, we talked about manga and stuff. You actually grew up in France. I did, yeah. So um, I was born in Australia. You but lost I, the accent. I, yeah. <laughs> I can talk like this, but uh, it's not very practical. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so born in Australia, but um, raised in France, spent 23 years in France. And so, yeah, France and Japan had a big cultural exchange in the late 80s, early 90s. Right. Um, which meant that I got a lot of, you know, I grew up with a lot of the mangas that maybe are a little bit more underground. Um, so, so we're talking beyond Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not the sort of the main stuff, like high school, Kibangumi, all that kind of stuff. Right. Like, um, and, yeah, then I went on to kind of study design, sort of graphic design background, into branding. And then, yeah, life just kind of pushed me to becoming an illustrator. So why, why fight it? Mm. Um, became a freelance illustrator. And just sort of quite recently, actually, the, the stuff that's on my website is probably about, goes back about two years. Uh, yeah. I've been doing this for about 15 years. Mm. And so, yes, yeah, so about two years ago, I had a bit of an epiphany and thought, I just want to do what I want to do, which sounds kind of 
stupid when you say it like that, but um, no, yeah, so great. I started, you know, working with the, the 80s aesthetic, the neon colors, manga, cyberpunk, and yeah. I get that question a lot, is like, how would you define your style, and like we were saying earlier, all I have is just, I can just say separate words that don't really sort of connect well. Yeah. Um, and, and then the, everyone the, would just nod along and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, sure, yeah. So the, the challenge in my work, as you guys will see, is then to try and take, you know, Akira and Princess Mononoke and the 80s and just smash them all together into one work and see what comes out. It's just like seemingly kind of disparaging ingredients on the same pizza, but hopefully the pizza works. Like pineapple and ham. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, I love it. All right. Well, um, what are we going to do today? All right. So today uh, I'm going to take you through guys through a few. Uh, excuse me. I'm going to take you guys through a few things. Um, the main thing that we're going to do is we're going to be coloring up this piece. So um, this is a piece that I've kind of prepared earlier that I've done a little while ago. Um, mm. I'll very briefly talk about sort of the process of doing the line work, but mm. um, the, the focus of today is color. Uh, so you can see there's a little color wheel up here in the corner there. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be kind of basing it off that, but what I'd really love to do is to throw it over to you guys to get involved and kind of help me out with some color choices, lighting choices, all of that. That can come a little bit later. Okay. Um, but yeah, essentially we'll be adding color to um, this rad samurai helmet. Cool. Uh, and then as I go along, I'll be talking about a, a few different things. That's great. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so we'll use the chat room to ask some questions and you guys can help make some decisions. Yeah. Which is pretty sweet. Um, hey, hey, Glenn. Hey, Leisure. Am I saying that right? Probably not. Saratul from Malaysia. What's up? And Singapore. This is so cool. we got Southeast Asia in the house. Very cool. Easy, one of my favorite illustrators, me too. Um, we actually go back quite a way. Yeah, we do. We've been working together for quite a few years. All sorts of things. In, in education and <laughs> design and a bunch of different things. Yeah, Always a have. pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Always good to, good to hang out with Jeremy Lord. Um, so, again, just a reminder, if you do have any questions once we get started, jump into that chat room. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so let's dive right in. Yep. Um, first things first, as I, I probably need to kind of mention a few um, different things. To begin with, uh, what I'm working on currently is uh, Microsoft Surface Studio. So it's a nice, big kind of surface. Um, I, one of the things that I really like about it is the color rendition on the screen is awesome. And yeah. this is all about color. So those really bright kind of contrasting colors are really great. It's nice to have a bit of real estate to kind of move your arm around as well. Yeah. Um, the second thing is I'm using Photoshop. I almost exclusively use Photoshop. Uh -huh. um, you'll see from the work that I do, I'll, there'll probably be a few questions come up um, that usually are around why don't I use Illustrator to get those smooth lines and flat colors. Mm. Um, the answer is good question. Um, <laughs> just going to preempt that question straight away. But yeah. the, I, I find Photoshop just feels more like I'm drawing, whereas Illustrator is a little bit more image building. Um, right. The other main thing that I really need to, to mention here is that I am working in RGB. So if you can see on my screen here, right. my image mode is in an RGB workspace as opposed to CMYK workspace. Mm -hmm. um, that's really important because RGB has a wider color range, right. call it a camera color um, which allows me to get those neon colors. So if you're trying to get this kind of bright pink on your screen at home mm. and it's Photoshop is changing it to a kind of a duller version of it, it's because you're in CMYK and not RGB. Okay. So if you want those really sort of bright colors, if you want to sort of work along as I'm doing this, make sure that you're in RGB. Awesome. Um, yeah, so without further ado, um, let's dive right in. So I've... I've, as I said, I've prepared a, a few different things. Um, you guys can see this kind of color wheel that I've done up here. So I've, uh, I've originally sort of colored this with these colors. Um, and again, very neon colors, very kind of, you know, bright um, contrasting colors, mm -hmm. something that I really sort of am quite passionate about. Um, you guys can see here as well, I've, I've sometimes like to kind of look at different color wheels that I do from different pieces. So all of these represent a piece that I've done. Right. Um, you can see that there's the pink and the blues that come back quite frequently. Again, they're the this, this sort of standard 80s neon colors. Yeah. Do you dream um, in neon? Uh, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah I'd love to. Um, <laughs> But otherwise, yeah, in life I live all things neon. I've got some pink shoes on at the moment, which you guys can't see. But yeah. um, 
Uh, yeah. So these are these are the kind of the color wheels that I I might sort of try and have a look at before doing a piece, just to get things going. Mm. Uh, thinking about you know what can I do? Oh, I could use maybe I could use this one, uh, but instead of the the green, it could be a different color. So yeah, just really kind of playing around with that. Uh, but I don't spend too much time on that, and you guys will see why a little bit later on. Mm. Uh, but it is nice to, to just have that. So this is a, a Photoshop file that I've got sort of pre-prepared with all these layers here that you can see, um, and I can just go in and edit a color as I need to. So, for instance, like I said, if I don't like that green, I can go and sort of change it to an orange, see how that looks, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, really kind of play around with that. We'll come back to that in, in just a minute. Cool. Um, so... With this, um, we're going to try and, again, get that real sort of dramatic 80s neon uh, kind of lighting. And some of the things that we will do for that, as you guys can see in a lot of the pieces that I will work with, is I like to have a sort of a, a range of different colors. Mm. Maybe there'll be sort of, you know, this color wheel here that I work with here has six colors. Right. Um, can I say, I'm going to ask a silly question. Yeah. The circle over the top. Yeah, so the circle over the top here is those colors in shading form. Right. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that all right, a little I'm bit later ahead. on. I'm getting excited. All right. Uh, but it's nice to just kind of see the variation. So obviously, if I was to screen print this, all of a sudden, adding in shading, and I've got 12 colors. So that's right. 12 screens instead of six. So the production things that come into play. But mm -hmm. otherwise, a, a six color scheme is a nice one to work with. Some people work with five. Mm -hmm. um, there's roughly 17 million colors that we can kind of see so right. trying to sort of narrow it down a little bit to six is probably going to be useful to get your work going yeah um so yes yeah, so i like to work with sort of you know we've got these colors here these three kind of shades of blue got two different shades of kind of pinkish and then this green that comes in a little bit in the illustration but it kind of underneath it really balances it out and uh, mm. that's what we were talking about before this sort of this idea that you know, you're, you're making this kind of pizza you want to throw in a separate taste. It's kind of like that little bit of, like, hot sauce or mustard on your chicken wing just to yeah. bring in a, a spark of, of light a little bit. Um, so that is something that I often try and do, working mm -hmm. with relatively similar colors and then throwing in a different tone. Very cool. um, and you can see that again in here. So this this is the color wheel for that. So I've got three blues and then three kind of reddish pinks. Mm. So there's maybe a little bit less contrast here. But if I want to push that to the max, then I can work with something much more monochromatic. And here you've got the same kind of image all in monotone with this light here. Mm. Um, and this blue light that we've got here is what's referred to as a bounce light. Okay. So a bounce light is something that's really handy. If I switch that off in the layers there, you can still see that it's got a little bit of volume, but it's maybe got a little bit less kind of pop to it. Right. So we only have one light source. Yeah. So the light source coming from this neon is this kind of green, uh, sorry, <laughs> pink color there, which is, you know, again, without it, it starts to be even a little bit more flat, mm -hmm. but throw that in, it matches up with the light. Light is volume. Without light, you've got no volume at all. So mm -hmm. a circle is just a circle. You put in some shading in there, it becomes a sphere. It gives it right. roundness right. and volume, right? Okay. Um, and again, without light, it would just be completely black. So you really want to work with those lights to get that. But in an image like this, where we've got an overarching amount of, of pinks and purples and you know all the same kind of color tone, throwing in this blue all of a sudden really makes that blue stand out. Mm. And it's called a bounce light because it makes you imagine that there's something happening over here outside the image that you can't see. So is it always an invisible source of light? With it the doesn't have light? to be. It doesn't have to be. It okay. doesn't have to be. I could put in, you know, I could draw in a, a neon over here and that could, you know, be the source of that light. But it's nice to kind of let the audience guess a little bit. Like there's something outside of here. The image goes beyond just the frame of the image. Right. It's a right. nice little trick to, to kind of do that. Um, Great trick. But yeah, so that's that's a kind of a bounce light that I would like to use, but generally in contrast with it. So something warm, something cold, something bright, mm -hmm. something dull. Um, yeah. The Thank last you. thing that I will say before we start sort of jumping into the actual work is... Um, this idea that I really sort of live by, um, because I work with neons and sort of very, very bright colors, 
there's a kind of a saying that says that something is only as bright as whatever around it is dark. Right. Um, and plainly put, that's kind of the reason why we don't turn neon signs on at night. Uh-huh. Because uh, sorry, during the day. During the day. Um, they, you'd still see them, but they wouldn't pop as much. Yeah. And neon only really flashes if it's you dark. You get that like it. fuzzy kind yeah, exactly. of gradient happening. Yeah. Mm. So what happens here is is exactly this, right? So we've got these this line work on a white background, mm. um, and if I kind of turn off all the outlines, it just becomes this kind of a mess of colors. You can still kind of see it, uh, but it's kind of hard to guess. But more importantly, mm. the colors really don't pop. Whereas if I switch that background to a dark background, all of a sudden those colors really start to shine. Yeah, that's the stuff of nightmares right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so you can really kind of see that artwork even just from the highlights. Right. Again, um, that's what f- like photography is writing with light. Right. I kind of like to try and do the same thing with my work is like that. define the, the artwork just from the lighting around it. Mm. Um, and obviously then I've got these these colors that go into it and the light source to match. But it's it's kind of fun sometimes just to look at your artwork like this and see really, really popping hmm. without that. Otherwise, it's just colors. Yeah. This, this is now light, but light needs dark in order to be light. Oh, it's like a yin and yang. That's yeah. like a, you yeah. just came back from Japan. This is That's really, like a, really deep. Yeah. This is deep. I love yeah, it. Japan, the land of neon as well, but it, like it only like... You know, Shibuya Crossing looks cooler at night. Right. Because all the neons and all the signs and the TVs are all I've only been there really during fun. the day. Should I have gone uh, at night? Yeah, you should go oh, there. No. You've done it wrong, sir. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, so those are the, sort of the, the basic fundamental principles. Like okay. you, you need the dark color to make the light color pop. Yeah. And you really want to get that color contrast going. Monochromatic is okay, but it tends to be a little bit flatter. So it's just nice to bring in something to add that contrast of color. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, yeah, so let's let's dive right in. So this um, is started out as a digital sketch, uh, okay. working with just a, a blue pencil, just because it's standard standard brush. I'm not using any fancy brushes here. Mm-hmm. Um, the main thing that I will do is I'll talk a little bit about smoothing, uh, because I like to get nice kind of smooth buttery lines, which is why some people are like, why shouldn't you do this in Illustrator? Because Illustrator is better at doing those smoother buttery uh-huh. lines. Yeah, we get that question a lot when we yeah. have an Illustrator on, you know, especially yeah. using Photoshop. But I, I like to be. I like to feel like I'm drawing the lines myself. Mm. So I will literally just use this standard round edge brush, no spacing, and then just put in the um, the shape dynamics. So again, all these um, you know uh, tablets and, and surfaces all have pressure sensitivity. So when I press down lighter, the line gets thinner yeah. and or thicker, depending on how hard I'm pressing. So you can really get that. But the smoothing stops it from being all kind of janky and jiggly yeah. and gives you that really smooth line. Mm. Um, so that's that's something that I, I work with. Again, I won't get too much into that. The main reason why I've got these really thick outlines, proportionally speaking, to the artwork mm. is some sort of element of style making it kind of kind of cartoony cell shading but also what it does is as soon as i come in with the color here so i'm just going to get rid of that gray um you'll see that what i'm actually going to do is i could actually paint it mm-hmm. using a brush um in order to paint it's probably a better idea to turn off the smoothing Okay, on your brush uh, because you want to paint quickly right so let's just randomly pick a color red will do if i'm trying to paint like this smoothing tends to slow down your brush stroke a little bit right so it's just it's possible that it's just not as responsive Mm. so i tend to prefer turning that down and then you can really go to town on the coloring in the problem i find with this is i mean it, it can be fun sort of coloring in an image but you get all these little bits that you may have missed like you can see there's just a little yeah. tip of white just there and another one just there it's like a human error it becomes a bit of you a can actually see it from here the little tiny little yeah. white bit and i guess uh, like with any designer or artist once you see it you can't unsee it yeah, so it really you screen print a shirt like this and there's always a little yeah. a little white dot yeah and then you send it to the printer and the clients unhappy because it's come out and what is this like oh i didn't see it right so what i do in order to avoid that from happening is i actually use the lasso tool 
Okay. All right. So yeah. in Photoshop, um, the lasso tool, which is just this guy here, mm -hmm. um, there's different options for it. I just use the regular lasso tool, which allows you to dr draw a selection, mm -hmm. and then that selection is is ready to go. Um, and this is where the thick outlines come in really handy because I've got that, I've conveniently named it base color. And then I can actually, if I kind of shake a little bit on the line here, it doesn't matter because I've got this really thick black outline as a kind of buffer area, as yeah. a sort of safe zone. And then I can literally just go in and make a really quick selection around all that artwork. Um, there we go. Yeah. And then I can... I can fill this with my red here. So, I a, a lot of times I get my students because I teach a Billy Blue as well. Yeah, I think um, someone was saying in there um, your favorite teacher, <laughs> which is pretty thanks. cool. I didn't catch the name. That's right. We'll go back through the chat yeah. afterwards. You can find out. I'll, and, I'll boost your grades. Yeah, they get a, they get an A um, plus. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I a lot of the uh, my students will ask me where the menus are. I don't know where the menus are in Photoshop because I just use all the shortcuts. Yeah. Once right. you find out where the shortcuts are, you never go back into the menu. That's the whole point of a shortcut. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so. And you don't look at the keyboard at this point either. You're yeah. Just feeling it most of the much. time. Yeah. Um, so what I use in order to fill with a foreground and background color. So Photoshop, you've got a foreground and background color down here. Um, is I will use uh, Control or Command. Um, whoops, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, backspace fills with your. Uh, I'll just pick a different color from my background color. This lovely, disgusting green. <laughs> um, so that will fill with the background color. So my red and Alt or Option backspace yeah. fills with your foreground color. So that's a really good sort of shortcut to know. That so you don't have one. to go into the menus. Just really quickly, just fill with a background color. Just make sure that you're holding in. Control or option before you hit backspace because if you just hit backspace, it'll just delete that selection. So obviously so. you can like click it and change it and everything, but these shortcuts obviously speed up your process. Yeah. If you're doing yeah, this do. every day, if you're doing this for ten hours or something Absolutely. like that, like you, yeah. you're going to find some efficiencies there. Yeah, and the old Control or Command Z to undo yeah. um, is always a handy one. Mm. Um, and so then, yeah, I'll just sort of continue making this um, selection again, having that thick kind of outline just means that my life is a bit easier at this stage because uh -huh. I can just kind of have a bit of more margin for error to fill that in. And I like to just kind of fill the entire base of an illustration first, mm -hmm. even though obviously not the entire illustration at this stage will be red. Right. It's just nice for kind of future purposes to have the entire thing nice and filled. And using the lasso tool means that I am sure that I won't miss any little kind of skerricks of white in my you're still doing that pretty confidently in. and pretty quickly i've got to say <laughs> <laughs> and so do you always draw with quite <clears throat> thick lines like this uh i like to uh, partially for like practical reasons yeah. like what i've just been talking about um also just for kind of style reasons it's a it's a manga influence it's a comic book influence mm -hmm. kind of you know having those little bit of um thick outlines just gives stuff, it a yeah. bit more definition it's also really fun to work with um these kind of outlines. We have a really good question um, from Christy. You always have the best questions, Christy. I'm sure those people are asking as well, wondering as well. Um, would you consider using the magic wand tool to select an area? Just asking. So maybe you know why not the magic wand tool? Yeah. So I could totally do that. The problem is, is that it as we started this illustration, mm. there's nothing in here to select. Okay. So all I've got is this outline here of. The drawing. So I could go in here mm -hmm. and use the magic wand to select in there and then go to a different layer and fill that with red. Right. The problem is, is that the magic wand, because my line, because I'm using bitmap, right. vector, the selection isn't always perfect. And so you see this white space in between there right um not only that this is but the first movie of harry potter magic wand level right <laughs> like it hasn't quite yeah everyone's still yeah. trying to figure it out yeah so yeah. the thing is I, I could do that but it would actually be slower because then i'd have to select every single bit so yeah. it's actually faster at this stage for me to just make a selection using the magic wand, the lasso tool cool. and then just fill it <laughs> yeah then later on i can make some selection using the magic wand great um but Here's a hot tip for you guys. Some of you guys might know this. Some of you guys might not. You can actually make a selection of a layer without using the wand uh -huh. by clicking uh, Control and clicking on the actual 
thumbnail of that layer. Right. And you'll see that my marching ants get selected. So this is a really quick fire way of just selecting every single pixel in that layer, whether mm. they're red or not. Yeah. It's actually a lot more handy than the magic wand. Awesome. That's a yeah. really good tip. Um, um, definitely. And I think, Nick, we're going to get to that, actually. We're going to get to the neon part. Um, so if you stick around towards the end, we're going to get to the neon right at the end, and Jeremy's going to show a couple of tips on how he gets that neon look. So yeah. definitely stick around. Yeah, we'll get to sure. that. Promise. Um, okay, so from this point on, uh, I've got my base layer, uh -huh. and I need to start sort of putting in some layers. But maybe the red will stay. Maybe the red won't stay. Mm -hmm. um, we've got this color palette up here that we can use. Um, happy to throw it over to you guys as well as we're doing this. Throw out some suggestions of like maker's helmet, you know. Well, so Claire T or something um, asked in the asked in the chat. Said want to see some yellow. So could, could we make? Okay. What if we wanted to make that let's, yellow. Let's make a yellow. All right. So there's a couple of ways we can do this. This is Photoshop. Yeah. We're controlling pixels. So there's like 17 different ways of changing the color of something. Mm. Um, the two ones that I use the most, if I know, like for instance, if I'm working for a client, right, and the client says make it, you know. Purple or yellow or whatever. And clients never design. make changes. No, that's ridiculous. Actually, like clients <laughs> like giving you colors sometimes is a bit of a, a blessing because it's just like I don't need to think about colors. Yeah. So I'll just do yours. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So all right. So let's make this yellow. So either one of two things. Either we can go in and select a kind of like a, a nice yellow from here, um, and so that's just sort of double clicking on the on the front color, uh, and then I can either use the magic wand or whatever. But what I will do now is actually, rather than make a selection, mm -hmm. which as we saw, selections aren't always perfect, I'm actually going to lock the transparency on this layer. And this is something that I use a lot. So this guy on my base color layer, I'm going to go up to here to this little kind of checkerboard thing. I don't know if you guys can see that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just going to click on that. And this locks the transparency of my layer. Right. right? What that means is that if I come in with my yellow brush, if I'm painting over here, nothing happens. But as soon as I go on to an area that doesn't have see-through pixels, mm -hmm. it starts painting. Cool. So this is kind of the equivalent of making a selection and then filling that selection. Mm. But it's just faster and cleaner. Nice. Um, so now I've got that locked. So if I fill my layer with that yellow, it'll just fill the skull. If I don't have that filled, that option selected, it'll just fill the entire layer. Right. Right. So this is then saying that all these pixels here that are transparent, all this sort of gray and white checkerboard that we're familiar with in Photoshop is transparent pixels. Mm. None of those will get touched. They're locked. Right. Only the non-transparent pixels. That is cool. So you can go back through and change it fairly quick. Yeah. So mm. this is this is a, a nice way of kind of doing it. If you if you've already made the color and yeah. the client has come back and said, oh no, I actually wanted it to be this color, trying to match it up, trying to select it perfectly. This is just so much faster. Excellent. All right. Mm. So I can do that, or I can do this, which is what I would most often do actually. Mm -hmm is go into my uh, hue saturation slider. So uh, command or control U. It's it's up in the menus up here somewhere. Don't ask me where again. I haven't been up into the menus in about 10 years. Right. Um, I'll just do control U, and it brings up this hue saturation slider. Now, you guys will see me use this a lot because mm -hmm. this is where I live. Like that sort of thing of designers kind of moving stuff around a pixel or two. Yeah. This is me on this This is your thing. version. This is like, ah, uh, here? Here, here, maybe, maybe not, maybe not. Right. The thing that I really like about it is that it's live. It's mm. it's doing it as I see it. So I can actually slide that around looking at my work and going like, oh, yeah, that's really cool, actually. I really like that color. So it's a bit of trial and error. Yeah. Well, a lot of trial and error. Completely <laughs> trial and error. So this is kind of, you know, going the opposite direction to what we were talking about before. It's like choose your colors and then apply them. This is just me going like I'll like the color when I see it uh -huh. kind of thing. But And do you think that's an experience thing as well, like to see yeah. that quickly? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. And like it's a bit ironic what I'm about to say because what I really like about it is mm. that sometimes it gives me quite unexpected color choices, right. not choices that I would have made, mm. even though, as you guys saw from my color wheels, I tend to always make the same or similar kind of color choices. Yeah. Uh, but for me, for instance, like this, I, I, I'm really into trying to sort of 
use very, very, very subtle colors. And I always give my, my printer a very, very difficult task because trying to get that, it's like it's not quite pink. It's just a little bit more blue. It's a little right. bit more red. It's just you got to get it perfectly right. Um, so one of the things that I will do, for instance, I'll just make this yellow real quick. So, again, just using so that. So while, while we're doing this, JB asks, can you do an impression of a French-speaking client? So maybe like <laughs> 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 maybe in this situation the client's asked you, you know, to change change the color. What, what might that sound like? I don't know if I can do that without being extremely offensive. Um, can you offend yourself? <laughs> Maybe there's probably <laughs> no one said they were from France in the chat. So uh, I don't know. I don't have very many French clients actually, but uh, yeah, it would probably sound like, "Can you make this yellow, please?" <laughs> there you go. Um, You're welcome, JB, in the chat room, and everybody else that <laughs> <laughs> that really wanted to go down that road. Um, so yeah, so we've made this yellow now using either hue saturation or or filling it with a specific color that we've chosen. Right. Um, one of the things that I wanted to touch upon as well is that you'll notice if I go back into um, this illustration here, mm. one of the things that I like to do is work with colors that are a little bit surprising. Mm -hmm. right? So a black is never really black. So you guys can see on the screen here, it's a little bit lighter than on my screen. That's sort of a very dark navy. Mm. Uh, but even if I was to make this black, I would often just go into my color picker here and just bring it up into like a, a blue or just very, very, very slight difference in between the two. So you can see it here because it's comparing it to the black. Right. But if I go in here and fill that space, that's just going to look black on my illustration. Right. But I, there's something I really like about the fact that it's not quite black. It's actually very difficult to get a perfect black in nature. Yeah. And yeah. the perfect white in nature. There's always a tiny little bit of color to it. Yeah, there's actually um, quite a lot of digital designers like working in the digital space that have certain rules that are like that as well. Yeah. And the same thing, there is no 100% black because 100% yeah. black, there's no light. Exactly. And so, you know, if you do it on screen, there's actually something a little bit unnatural about it. So they like to put like a, just a little bit of color in there just so it's not completely. Yeah. And I think the, the, th the thing is with that is that like a lot of people might not notice that. Yeah. But they do. Right. Just don't, it's kind of like feng shui. It's like, it just feels right. I don't know why. It's like, yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so one of the things, again, like this is a bit of an example of this. Um, I don't know if, how well this is going to kind of show on the screen, but you guys can see here what I've done is I've actually put um, the two reds are the same. And I've put a gray square on each one just to kind of show this idea of contrast and kind of changing colors just very slightly. The one on the left, this one here, uh -huh. is just pure gray. Right. Right. This one here has a bit of green through it. Okay. So that's just going into color balance, which is um, command or control B, and I need to select a layer. Usually that helps. Uh, yep. And then literally just kind of adding in a bit of green. So if I do that, obviously, you can start to see that it's going into the right. green. But just doing it without it making it too obvious. And green and red are complementary colors. They're at opposite ends of the color spectrum. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good amount of contrast. So what that does is it just means that the gray versus the red on the right has more contrast than the gray versus the red on the left. Right. And if you move that into a gray scale area, you guys can kind of maybe see there's a tiny little bit more contrast in between this gray and that gray than on this side. Right. Simply by changing that a little bit. So Can yeah. you guys can you guys see that in your screen? I'd be interested because everyone's gonna be on a different screen, right? Yeah. It's the thing about the internet. Yeah, it's a little bit it's also my screen is calibrated and so it gets a little bit tricky. But yeah. the theory behind the theory it is, behind it and is seeing, sound. Yeah. It's, yeah. So that's just cool. trying to get like if you were to say, um, you know, with this one for instance, if I was to fill in the background, I wouldn't just go with a black. Right. right. First of all, if I did that, then I'd lose all my outlines, which is a That's bit true. sad. Because you did the outlines in black. <laughs> <laughs> or, or I could do my outlines a different color as well, which is possible. But what I would do here is I would actually take a purple um, or a blue because they're complementary colors to the yellow. Mm. And yellow, like yellow and purple, it's the Lakers, it, this is a nice color combo. Right. So I'll go into a purple here and choose a really, really dark purple and then fill my background with that. I think there were some people in the chat that really like purple. This is um, becoming very popular. Okay, cool. Well, then we'll stick with the purple. <laughs> um, all right, so we've got that base color. It's kind of you know mixing well with the, the illustration. Yeah. At this stage, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new layer, and I'm going to pick a different color for the actual helmet 
portion of this. Okay, cool. We actually got a question, um, sorry, that I missed. Um, so thanks, thanks, Alex, for the shout out there. Um, how do you choose between complementary and monotone color tones? Uh, how do you mean? That's a good question. Maybe clarify that. Um, so it just says, how do you choose between complementary and monotone colors? So, the, I mean, the, you, you can use a, like a color wheel. So that old color mm-hmm. wheel that we all saw in kind of design school where you guys can see. I think um, I painted that with gouache. Yeah. I don't know yeah, if people you would still have. do Most that. people, yeah, you use gouache <laughs> because gouache is a flat color. Um, right. And it just renders the color better because it doesn't go as streaky as other colors. Uh-huh. So you can see the color for its value a little bit better. But, oh. um, yeah, if you look at just kind of that. like any color wheel online, You'll you'll notice like the way you use a color wheel is basically colors that are at opposite ends of the spectrum are the colors that you want to use. So essentially, if you look at something like this, for instance, the yellow is complementary to the purple because right. they're opposite ends of the spectrum, mm. right? So this is kind of like a color spectrum that's been rolled up into a wheel. Blue and orange are complementaries. Red and green, we looked at a complementaries there. Mm. This is how you kind of use a color wheel to say, like, all right, these are all warm colors, and I need a color on the opposite end to spike that. Right. That's the sort of the basic theory behind it. I think um, that might be the color wheel that I made. Uh, it's, it's plagiarism. They're all pretty similar, yeah. It looks really It's a pretty familiar. sort of standard it might be mine. design school exercise. What do I do about that? <laughs> <laughs> Sue the internet. Yeah. That's um, amazing. All right, so I've taken a shortcut here. Rather than fill in the entire helmet, I've just filled in the mask portion of it. Right. Um, again, pink and yellow, maybe this will work, maybe it won't work. But mm. what I will do at this stage is probably, like, switch it up. So if I'm using yellow, I might use try and use something that's going to be a little bit different. So, again, I'll go onto my color layer and do Control-U and then mess around with that until I get somewhere that I like. Um, and maybe something a little bit darker again to make that pop maybe purple, maybe a kind of a different shade of purple just to kind of keep in in line with what we've done. Um, maybe, you know, something like this, just something a little bit darker than the yellow to, to make it stand out. And you play, you're play you playing with all three variables there. You're playing with the hue, the saturation, and the light yeah, dark. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. Um, just to, again, make that pop. Saturation probably will be the main thing that you want to be in RGB for, otherwise mm-hmm. it won't work quite as well. Um, but, yeah, so now I will make the sunnies, and I'll do this relatively quickly so we can start kind of messing around with this. And you'll see, like, what I meant before when I was talking about, you know, how it takes me a very long time to, to mess around with colors because as soon as it's... As soon as we've got a few elements on here, so now we've got a background, mm. a helmet, the sunnies, and the mask. That's four different colors. So I could just look at all of this and think, you know, like, what if the sunnies were pink and the face mask purple? Right. And what if the helmet was purple but the sunnies pink and then the face was green? Then it's just this like... This is where you start, like, yeah. playing around with all the variables exactly. and changing everything. And do you get frustrated and, like, get up and have Completely. to go for a walk? Completely, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you're like, why is everything like, outside so dull? <laughs> yeah, and it, it really gets to the point where I'm just like, oh, just Jeremy, just make a decision already and just stick with it. Uh, and, like, you know, making the actual line work and the artwork coming up with the concept yeah. should be the hard part. Yeah. For me, the hard part is, like, which version do I choose? Right. And I'll make a few different versions of a, of a different piece and just go, like, I like this one as well. I like this one too. Right. Which is where a client is really handy because the client goes, like, Yes to all, except we're going to go with that one. Right. And so you make that call, it's out of my hands. But yeah. when if it's me, it's just like, here's 17 illustrations of the same illustration. Yeah. Just different colors. Yeah. And so would you often do, you know, the rule of three with graphic design and stuff like that? Yeah. I'll show them three, get them to choose, rationalize why, and then I'll go away and then you yeah. kind of deliver one. Is that very common? Yeah. yeah. I, I will do that with clients, but when I'm doing personal work. Yeah. I can't do that yeah. because I'm the one deciding and creating at the same time. So that's when I'll start making, like, um, I'll show you guys an example of what I mean. Mm. I've only brought two of these, um, but this illustration I did along with this one. There was actually seven others that I did in completely different color variations to this. Mm. Um, So, yeah, it's just like this is where I have... My fun, but also my frustration of, like, I love all these colors, but which one do I do? Like, spoiled by choice, right? Like, as yeah, you said, yeah, there's totally. so many colors, there's so many combinations that there's no right or wrong, I guess. Yep. It's just Someone was asking about the, the yellow dots um, left on the border. 
And so I think they're meaning like around the around the. Uh, top so of the, the they're the little kind of horns on the side of the helmet there. But mm. again, because we've got that really dark background and a really dark outline, they just look like little dots right. on the side there. So this is where maybe I will go in and grab my outlines, mm. lock the transparency on those, and pick a different color for it. Yeah. And so maybe brighten that up a little bit. Well spotted. I like that the audience interacted with us in such a way that demonstrated the purpose of getting this right. Yeah. Like the color contrast. That's exactly why they look like little dots on the screen, which is well well picked up. Totally. So mm -hmm. then again, so here we are, right? So we're back into this position now where we're trying to pick a different color for the outline. Mm -hmm. And if I've got this color here, for instance, that's no good because this color is now brighter than a lot of the colors that I've got in the illustration. Yeah. The outline needs to be the darkest thing in there, otherwise it doesn't give that definition anymore. So right. what do you do? Like the This is quite like sell this to Cricut Australia. It's nice green and gold, but <laughs> uh, it doesn't work everywhere else. So you want to sort of pick a color that is going to work everywhere else. And again, gravitating mm. towards the purple because it works well with the yellows, but it could be kind of like this dark maroon and then make that a little bit darker again. And then that's starting to work well. It's kind of working well with the mask too. We're mm. getting an overall tones of like hot colors with the the yellow, the red, or sort of the pinkish red and the, that sort of maroony red color. Mm. Um, so yeah, so that, again, we can just kind of continue working up different layers and I'm not naming my layers here. I should name my layers. That's a really bad thing yeah, to not someone, do. Yeah, someone called you out in the chat before. Yeah. I let it slide. Um, but yeah, yeah, we're gonna have a conversation afterwards for sure. Yeah. 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 Look, when you're in the you know the, the the groove of the moment, you just make layers and you try stuff out, and maybe the layer will get deleted in its future life. Maybe it won't. Right. Uh, I tend to just not name and then come back and just go. All right, cool. Like part do, of your do a bit of maintenance, cleaning up. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah. So maybe uh, at I this bet you stage, teach your students to label there. I do. Yeah. 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 But it's a it's a clear case, and students it's hypocrisy stop listening at this stage. They're like, yeah, I don't practice what I preach. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's just kind of... do as I say, not as I do? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. You should definitely label your layers. The boss isn't always right, but he's always the boss. <laughs> There's been so many comments that we can make into T-shirts. <laughs> I'm really excited. Um, that's really good. Um, we've, got, like, we've got a bit of time left. We've got like 20 minutes left or so. Um, just a reminder, you can join the chat and ask questions by using your Creative Cloud ID. So if you're sitting there wondering, um, you know, who is this, what is this chat room, how do I get involved? Um, that's how you do it. So in the top right-hand corner, your Adobe ID, so just your Creative Cloud login details, jump in there. If you don't have one, you can sign up really quick. Um, jump in there and ask us some questions. And we'll do some, maybe we'll do some Q&A at the end because there's been quite a few questions. We may have missed one, so yep. um, so yeah, we'll do a little bit of a Q&A at the end and have a bit of a chat. Awesome. Nice. Um, so just, yeah, just going to add the, the horns in a little bit just to make them the same color as the mask. Again, trying to sort of stick to a limited range of colors just to limit the amount of sort of decisions that I've got to make on this. But mm -hmm. yeah, at this stage, I'm, I'm sort of relatively happy with it. Uh, I might just again go to this um, sort of blue one here and add that because we've got strings. This one I will do with my brush tool just because it will be faster. They're almost kind of brush shaped. Right. Things anyway, so there's really no kind of like I always do this and I never do that. It really is just kind of context sensitive. Mm. Um, but yeah, let's say sort of okay, cool. We're we're happy with this as it stands. Mm. Um, what I'm going to do now is I need a light source. So this is cool. It's it's a little bit flat. I need I need some shading and I need a light source. Mm. So what I'm going to do is I always work with all of my color layers um, and I'll just label that Label them one. as we go. <laughs> um, I'll put them in a group, right? Um, so the reason I put them in a group is, is A, just means that, you know, if you're working with a lot of layers, which I, I tend to, you guys probably saw some from some of the early artworks, I've got like upwards of 50 layers in a piece. Um, what I'll do is that's a nice cleanliness thing, but it also means that now I can actually apply an effect to all of these layers that are mm. in that group. Okay. So here's how that works. I'm going to go onto that layer group, which I've just called culls because it's my sort of lingo for colors. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to get rid of this color palette that's annoying me real quick. And as we do this, we'll get to the end of this, and then we'll answer some of those questions, guys. So we, I see you, and we'll get to you in a sec. Um, 
so I'm going to now use what's called an adjustment layer. Yeah. Uh, adjustment cool. layer is really, really awesome. I work with adjustment layers a lot when I'm doing my shading and mm. lighting. Um, and it's a really kind of non-destructive way of doing things. So non-destructive means you can keep changing it, you can keep editing it. It's not like set in stone. Okay. If you kind of save the file and close it and come back, you can't undo those changes. Mm -hmm. If you do a non-destructive thing, you can just do whatever you want. So yeah. clients are always happy. I think it's the future of work. I, I think it, yeah. I, I don't think you could work today in a destructive. If you if you can way. work without deleting pixels or edit or changing pixels permanently mm. without having to rely on Command Z, you're in a good place. Yeah, great. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go onto that layer group where my four layers are in, and I'm going to go to this little kind of circle thing down here and just go and pick a hue saturation layer, and then really really important. I'm going to click on this guy. So what this guy does, if I don't have this guy on, you'll see what happens is as I make this darker, it makes the whole image darker. So my background is actually getting darker as well. Hmm. I don't want that to be the case. So I'm going to make this darker because I'm doing shading. And then I'm just going to click on this one. And what that does is it means that if I go into my layer panel here, you can see this is now only affecting the layer or layer group mm. immediately underneath it. So anything that's underneath here, i.e. my background, isn't affected by this change. Right. I can come back and edit that change if it was too dark or too bright. Um, so this is a really nice non-destructive way of working with things. Uh, and you'll see in a second that it's also put a layer mask. But before I say, uh, before I go on here, we were talking before about there's no such thing as black in nature or it's very difficult to come by. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the impressionists gave us was shading and lighting, and specifically shading, it's not just a black, a darker version of something. You need to put some color into it as well. Right. Right. So if you're putting like shading on like an orange box, like you got an orange cube and you want to put a shading on it, you need to put a bit of blue into your shading right so that it replicates reality mm. so what i'm going to do here is exactly that i'm going to add a little bit of warmth to the shadow because my image is overwhelmingly warm mm. at this stage so what i've done is just use a hue saturation to add a little bit of kind of red heat to that shadow and that shadow now feels a lot more realistic cool. also just a little bit more interesting than just it's just a thing with black yeah All right then what I've got is I've got a layer mask on this, and that's going to allow me to paint some shading back into it. So I'm going to go in with my brush on a layer mask using my smoothing, and I'm going to decide on a light source. So let's say, let's make this really dramatic. Let's say that the light's coming from underneath. Right. Right. So it's kind of like that horror movie lit underneath. So I'm going to paint with black here. I'm going to bring light back into this. Yeah, that's cool. And you want to think, I always kind of think about how light works on something like this. It's kind of like snow. If you're thinking like the light is coming in the direction, whatever, it's like snow, it's going to land on certain things and not on other things. Right, like the way that snow falls and Yeah, sits. exactly. Yeah. So if you've got like a, a log on the snow, it's only going to kind of taper off on the edges where the snow isn't clinging into it. That's The light's going to do the same thing. Right. So it's just a kind of a nice sort of 3D way of thinking how... Where would the light hit here? Where is it actually going to go? Without worrying too much, because at the end of the day, we're not doing a super realistic illustration, but yeah. it kind of needs to make sense from a, like a volume point of view and a lighting point of view. Um, so, yeah, so this is, again, just me kind of painting on this. So this is non-destructive. So I, if I screw up here, I can just switch back to black and I'll and paint fine. that shading back in. So and you can erase away as well, like as an extra level. Yeah. So you can do it very quickly. Exactly. And then you can fix up that bit on underneath the nose if you wanted to. So this is all in. just kind of me adding some nice, really kind of dramatic lighting into there. Um, you'll see that we've got a problem now with this blue. Mm -hmm. That blue isn't responding to the shading really well. Mm -hmm. So we might have to change that blue a little bit later on, which we can do. Right. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that in, in a little sec, but... Yeah, let's just get this lighting in there, nice and cool, looking nice and dramatic and kind of lit from below. I would do this a lot cleaner um, when I'm at home, mm -hmm. but yeah, you get the gist. It's, it's there. The really cool thing about this is, again, this is now shading waiting for my image to appear. So if I decide, um, sorry, 
going to change the yellow now, but if I decide I don't like the yellow anymore, mm. I can change that. Again, control U. I can switch that around, and the shading just remains applied to that. So great. So it's a really, like, it's just a good non-destructive. It's just there. Change the colors later on. Mm. Good to go. So let's say, yeah, this is, let's say we're going to change it to that, right? Very quickly, last thing I'm going to do is I need something to make this pop because it's mm -hmm. it's starting to be a little bit flat. There's a lot of kind of similar colors going everywhere. So I'm going to add in something that's going to be a light source. So um, I'm going to throw it over to you guys. And the, the photographers are loving this, by the way. There's a couple of photographers in the, in the <laughs> chat room and they're... They're really enjoying it, which is true because you're talking about light. Yeah, you're well, talking yeah. about the way that light works. This is like it's photography. And... You're writing with light, like you you're using the light to define an image, which is exactly what photography is. Very cool, very cool. Um, and don't worry, guys. I've seen those questions back in the chat. We'll get to them at the end. Okay, we'll we'll make sure we try to get back to some of those. Okay, so I'm going to put in a light source now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to make it uh, for the sake of time. I'm going to make it something real kind of cool and '80s. Uh, I'm not a typographer, so you hand writers and typographers out there please forgive me uh i'm just gonna write like something real cool like laser in a kind of 80s font something like that right, right. that doesn't say laser but whatever again i did my disclaimer i'm not a typographer <laughs> so i can do whatever i want um but what i'm gonna do now is i'm gonna go into this and i'm gonna give it some neon glow okay all right um so I'm going to double click on that layer and it brings up this guy and I'm going to go to this guy. So this guy, Outer Glow, is probably one of my favorite things in Photoshop. I literally could not do my work without this little effect that's right. pre-done for me. Um, and I'm going to make this into kind of a neon sign. So I'm going to pick uh, that similar kind of blue and there we go. Let's make this a little bit bigger so it's real kind of bright. And I'm going to give it an inner glow as well just to kind of, again, increase that kind of neon-y look. Mm -hmm. And then we're good to go. So that's just kind of a really cheap and easy way of making this. It's super 80s. Yeah. It's yeah. starting to be real kind of real into it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to undo this. I'll delete that layer. You'll see that the effect is still on there. So what I can literally do now is I can paint with neon lights. Wow. Because that is now, that effect is on the layer. And so it doesn't matter what I do. It's just going to stay that. That is super cool. Uh, and then obviously now that I've done that, I need to make that neon interact with my actual illustration. Mm. So I'm going to make a new layer, call it, neons use that same color and then i'm just going to go to town and paint with these neons again and again this is where i need my illustration to be relatively dark otherwise those neons won't show yeah right if my uh, if the helmet that i drew was a kind of a, a light blue then that's just not going to have the same impact. It's going to be really weird and nonsensical. Mm. And it's just, it's not really going to have that sort of like, wow, that's really shining through effect. Oh man, I that love I that effect. Get. That's so cool. Um, and so, yeah, I can kind of really go to town. And again, this is where like I prefer using Photoshop because I really feel like I'm drawing these rather than it would be faster and sort of better quality kind of smoothness mm. to do this in Illustrator. But I enjoy doing it more in Photoshop. And part of doing this is that you enjoy it. Otherwise, why would you keep doing it? Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's something that's really important to me as well. Um, to, to have in my work. So then, yeah, now we've got a lot of interaction between those two kind of elements. Mm -hmm. And then just for shits and giggles, I'll come in and add that bounce light that we were talking about. And cool. usually a bounce light is going to be the opposite. So I'm going to make that a nice warm light. Uh, and maybe this is where I'll bring back that yellow. Can we make it a yellow? I think Mar Marine yep. uh, mentioned a bit back uh, in the chat. Keen so on that bounce light. Here we go. And can you explain explain the bounce light just one more time? I think someone may yeah. have missed in the chat. So I just wanted a little bit more info on the, it. The principle of a bounce light is is this, right? So let's go ahead and make. Oops, excuse me. Uh, 
Jeremy uses his keyboard uh, <laughs> like a pianist, so he's just typing away quickly. So, all right, so we've got this sphere, right? So we got this ball, and we're going to sort of add some, some lighting to it. Um, and again... Oh, sorry, Marnie. <laughs> going to lock this up. Incorrect pronunciation. And add in a light source. Right? Right. Uh, actually, before I do that, I'm going to put an adjustment layer on that, make it a bit darker, and bring some light back into this. Okay, so we've got our ball that's kind of um, starting to, to look good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to apply that to it, and then I'm going to come around with a, another layer. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do this destructively, just this once. Light source. So we've got a shadow and this blue kind of light coming in, right? right? So now what we want is a bounce light is going to add that kind of roundness to it. So the, currently what we've got is we can really see the volume here, but then it kind of gets lost over there. Mm -hmm. We don't get this sense that this ball is actually kind of going, whoops, sorry, going back around over there. Right. Right? So we want that. So what we're going to do is just bring in a tiny little bit of a bounce light in there, and all of a sudden you get this impression that there is something happening on the other side of that board. Right. And it just makes the whole thing pop a little bit more. It adds a little bit more image contrast to the overall thing as well, mm. and it just means that you've got this kind of contrast. It's something that movie makers do a lot, actually. Right. Um, and animation as well, where if if somebody's kind of... There's a, a great scene in, actually, in um, Final Fantasy where there's somebody who's kind of having a bit of a conflict of interest in their mind, and they're trying to be mm. good but trying to be bad. One side of them is blue lit, the other side of their face is red lit, oh. to really increase that kind of contrast in between the two personalities. So it's one of those things that when you know what it is, you see yeah, it everywhere. exactly. So you see it in movies, yeah. and you're like, oh, You can be really obnoxious like... and whisper over to your, your friends yeah. in the theatre, like, I know what they're doing. I'm just trying to watch the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like, again, just adds a little bit of, of that. You want, theoretically, you want less amount of light on the bounce than your main source because right. it's just a, it's a cutout light. It's just a detail light. So mm. as it is, I'm probably making just a little bit too much light. Mm -hmm. um, again, maybe it's yellow, maybe it's not. Like I'll, I'll probably sort of back and go back and forth a bunch of times on that. But generally speaking, also you want it in the opposite direction. So um, in this case, if the lighting is coming from below, you, maybe you want it from above or from kind of above in, a, in an angle yeah. somewhere. And where, do you, where um, did you learn about lighting? Like did you study uh, photography? Design, no, design or? school. We no. did um, we did this sort of six-year program and we did a lot of colour theory. A lot of colours in yeah. six years? <laughs> yeah. That was yeah. a question from Carrie, so it seemed like a good time to throw that one in. Yeah. So, then, so yeah, so here we go. So we've got kind of like a, a finished thing, um, finished piece. Whether or not we're happy with the colours, again, this is where we can start to kind of mess around with this. Mm. And I'm I'm going to put in, sometimes I'll do this where I'll go in and put an adjustment layer over the whole thing mm. and just go to town and go like, hey, you know what? Actually, that's kind of cool. Yeah. The face mask is too dark, so then I can go back individually and change the color of the face mask because right. this is non-destructive. But it just means, again, this kind of goes counter to you planning out your colors. Mm. But it's open to some interesting surprises that you might not make normally. You know what always looks good? That neon down the bottom yeah. in any light. It looks awesome. Yeah, so again, like you want to... Can't go wrong. You really want to sort of, you know, think about what it is that you're trying to do. I generally tend to gravitate around sort of these kind of colors because that's just my aesthetic, no mm. reason. It's just like, why do you like blues? Because I do. Yeah. Um, but more, more importantly, what you want to avoid is trying to sort of end up with something like this. Mm. This is really muddled. It's just... You can't see what's going on. The neon doesn't pop anymore. It doesn't have the light anymore. Right. You've lost your outline on this horrible baby vomit green color. <laughs> um, so these are the things that you want to avoid having. You want to have a good amount of contrast in between things and a good definition to your image because, again, that's yeah. what light's all about. That's amazing. Um, Thanks, we've man. got so many questions that I'm. I promised I'd get back to. Are you cool to stick around? We'll answer yeah, a couple yeah, of absolutely. these questions. Shoot, please. Going to go backwards just because it's easier. Um, I'm just going to mess with these colors while you yeah, guys as you do go. That. As you yeah. go. Um, I know you studied in France, but what design school did you study? In? I studied at um, ESAG. 
which is uh, just kind What of like... What does that stand for? Uh, École Supérieure d'Art Graphique. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I just want to hear you talking French again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Um, Nick was asking, what if the concept drawing is more realism towards n not illustrative, like line vector work, when neon colours will work well? Um, Are you being is it like it's a more realistic style? I guess, yeah. Uh, it's just the same concepts apply no matter what you're doing. Right. You could be, I see, I follow a lot of photographers mm -hmm. who will take photos of like, you know, nighttime stuff and then they'll put a whole bunch of filters to make them really blue and, and pink mm -hmm. to get that kind of like neon cyber vibe kind of thing. Right. Um, so yeah, it, it doesn't, if you're doing kind of like real oil painting all this, the same kind of theory and concepts apply. Mm. Um, and in fact, you'll see a lot of concept artists working on, you know, like Blizzard or whatever. Mm. They will use that bounce light thing yeah. quite a lot. Yeah. They might not use the same sort of like, you know, color relations and things, but things like movies and video games where you need to instantly recognize your silhouette or your character in amongst a screen of a whole bunch of different things happening. Right. That is absolutely crucial. You know, the, the color scheme, it's, the, it's one of the things I found out um, this uh, quite recently, actually. Yeah. Almost the entire reason Indiana Jones has a hat is so that he's recognizable from everybody else in there. Right. It's that wide brim hat. Obviously, he's an adventurer as well, but it's yeah. one, it was a conscious decision from Lucas and Spielberg to give him a hat to really give him that kind of silhouette standing out. And in fact, the right. first shot that you see of him mm. in Temple of Doom is... Uh, no, sorry, not Temple of Doom. Uh, Raiders. Yeah, Raiders of Lost Ark. Is Art. silhouette of him, hat right. and the whip hanging on the side. I'm just trying That's to say, like, hey, by the way, this is the guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the silhouette that you look for now. Yeah. So, yeah, so whether it's like this kind of very stylized kind of sticker street art kind of thing mm. um, or whether you're working really sort of oils and digitally or whatever, the same kind of ideas apply. Nice. Um, Mukesh is asking, because this had thick outlines, it became easy using the lasso tool. Um, what if the lines are thin? Um, what works better when drawing with a mouse? There might be two questions in there. Uh, so, yeah. It's a good question. Um, you I'll, tend to I'll draw answer with, them, yeah. yeah in, so I tend to work with thick outlines just as a star thing and because it's easier. Yeah, yeah. If you've got thinner outlines, um, it's still possible. You just need to spend a little bit more time getting that detail right. It just means that, like, the thinner my line is when I was using the lasso tool, if that line is thinner, then it just means I need to be more precise right. in how close I get to it. Um, there's always ways that you can make selections in Photoshop. It's one of the sort of the main features of Photoshop. Yeah. Um, the second part of the question, which is how do you do it with a mouse? I'm sorry, but you kind of don't do it with a mouse. Right. Um, trying to paint like this with a mouse is like brain surgery with a brick. It's not going to come out super well. It's a pressure thing? Yeah, yeah, there's a pressure thing. There's a control thing. Mm. If you're doing in Illustrator, a mouse is actually better than a stylus because right. it's just a little bit more kind of... A bit more precise. You click, your hand doesn't shake. If mm. you're drawing, if you're kind of trying to paint and draw and make precise selections, mm. don't use a mouse. Yeah, okay. That's cool. not really answering the question, but yeah. It's no, it's fair enough. It's fair enough. It's important that people don't spend... Weeks and weeks trying to trying to yeah. emulate the style, and it's because they didn't have a stylus. Um, so, um, yeah, one of the other questions was, would it, wouldn't it be possible coloring in Illustrator as well, or is Photoshop more preferable? We kind of covered that early on, so if you missed yeah. the first little bit, maybe jump into that. Um, do you want to reiterate? Illustrator has a recolor artwork function, which is really cool. Right. Um, but it's less, um, it's less kind of live, if you mm. will. What I really like about Photoshop is, is this, is this hue saturation, which just gives me a live result. I can kind of slide it as I see it, increase the saturation, increase the lightness, get something to really pop well like that. Mm. Um, and then that's what I really, like everything that I've done here is possible in Illustrator. Right. It's maybe a little bit harder. And also I prefer Photoshop, so guess what? Yep, here yeah. we are. That's what we're doing. Um, so I have a question from Govind. Um, so please give some insight into to, to add some illuminated objects and transparent things like glass or hologram lens. Yeah, okay. So that's um, a pretty tricky one. I'm not an expert. The one, the one thing that I know about sort of doing glass is glass actually responds to light in a completely different way to solids, right? Okay. right? So things that it's see through, mm. like if you're drawing like a, a crystal or something. So let's say 
Uh, I'm going to do this really roughly here, so please, like, I am not a concept artist. Um, but if you imagine, let's say we got, like, a, a green, uh, green crystal or something. Green crystal skull, just keeping in the... Uh, maybe not a skull, because no, that would be really difficult. But so let's say it's some Jones kind of going. like some kind of like crystal, kind of shardy, like soul stone kind of thing. Cool. Um, yeah, something like that, right? Right. So how that's going to work is I'm, I'm probably going to have to make this a little bit darker. But let's say that your light source is coming from over there. Traditionally, what would happen is your light would end up over here. Right. Right? Makes sense. What happens on a crystal is light goes in through it and then latches onto the back of the opposite direction from the light source. Oh, wow. So it's a kind of a, a, a nice little tip. And then obviously you can come in. Uh, I'll do this on a separate layer. You can come in with some gradients and the like. Um, I like to work with gradients on a sort of a transparency layer and start to kind of mess around with... Uh, in fact, what I'll do is I'll just get a little bit of a an edge to that. Hmm. And you can start to kind of see things like that. I'm, again, I'm doing this really, really roughly right now. But right. that's the main sort of the theory behind it. It's like if you cool, draw a water drop, like yeah. a water drop will have that. And if the, there'll be a shine over here, but then it'll be dark right. through here. And then it'll progressively get lighter. Cool. Again, you'll need that sh that dark anyways here to make that white kind of reflection pop on to that thing. Hmm. Right? Need the dark to have the light, exactly. which is what you were talking about yeah. at the beginning, yeah. So that's the th again, like this is hmm. by no means am I qualified to kind of talk about all this stuff at length, but hmm. yeah, the theory behind it is that. But again, out of kind of star concerns, out of practicality concerns, I tend to not use too many gradients. And you can see that in like most of my work, which is again why I get those questions a lot about like, why don't you use Illustrator? Because it's just flat colors. Mm -hmm. um, I tend not to use gradients too much. Well, there's a gradient in the back there, but that's a really sort of easy, easy to handle gradient. But on the illustration mm -hmm. itself, it's all just flat colors. Right. Yeah, cool. And someone and, was asking, like, I think the chat's answered the question as well, like CMK, CMYK versus RGB. Obviously, for today's exercise, it was because we wanted to show off that that neon kind of cool yeah. color, which you can't get yeah, so with like CMYK. Yeah, so this neon pink, for instance, like if I, uh, let me just do this really quickly. If I flatten this image down. And no, Jeremy's not single, so I'll just... <laughs> I'll just cover that down right now. Um, if I switch, what you get for speaking French <laughs> on the live stream. If I switch to CMYK, you see what, immediately what happened to that pink. Yeah. So it kind of dulls it. Yeah. So the, it the color gamut of CMYK, the range mm. that you can get, isn't as good. Mm. So it's better to just work in, in RGB. Um, there'll be a lot of you guys out there who'll be thinking like, yeah, but you can't print in RGB. You can only print in CMYK. Mm. Not anymore. Right. There's what, with digital? really good printers mm. that have CMYK slash RGB printers. Mm. The printer that I use is a, is a mate of mine called Robert Wade. He always just nails everything that I do. Wow. And I give him some challenges. Really? Because, yeah. yeah, like he'll get these pinks and these neons and they'll be perfect. Wow. So you can get your work printed digitally in an RGB space mm. very, very well nowadays. All oh, right. Yeah. Okay. I didn't and if you want to take it even further, you can do screen prints and get specialty inks and they'll glow mm. in the dark and they'll do all sorts of really awesome stuff for you. So anything's possible. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, thank you so much, Jeremy. And thank yeah, you. Pleasure. Thanks for all your questions. Everyone in the chat. That were some awesome questions. Um, I hope we got to, to all of them or most of them. Um, where can people find out more about you, find your work? Uh, so as we saw kind of the beginning of the um, of the talk, I've got my website, yep. um, which is jeremylord.com, and I've got my Instagram, which is just jeremylord underscore. Nice. Uh, my Instagram is probably updated more often than my website. That's just the, the way the, the way world is. <laughs> these days. Especially for illustrators. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a follow and a comment on Instagram. If you guys have any other further questions as well, I'm usually sort of pretty good on Instagram. So nice. that would be the way to go. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. There's so much useful information in there. Heaps of questions out there. A lot of people saying that it was really, really useful. 
Awesome. For them in the chat. You guys oh, are awesome. Got something out of it. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Thanks, um, all you new folks. If you're watching this on YouTube and you missed out, um, you can go to adobeapaclive.com. We actually have a subscribe button on the website, so if you can find it, click that. And if you do click that, you'll be reminded every single time we go live, so you'll never miss one. Um, so enter in your details, and we'll make sure that you never miss an Adobe APAC Live. We are here every Wednesday from 2 to 3 p.m. this year, so we hope to see you this time next week. Thank you all, um, and thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, and thank all you guys for your questions. And, um, yeah, glad you guys got something out of it. Awesome. See you guys. Cheers.